is a tentative document. This is a, these are proposed rules we're going to be discussing today. They are not final. And part of the reason they're putting this out here is because they want all of you to respond. They want all of you to give feedback and to say, you know, there's no way we can implement these rules effectively in our operations given what we do and how we do it. So that's part of what, what we're bringing forth to you. Um, Michelle had mentioned in the packet there's, there's a document that talks about a, an upcoming listening session. That listening session, there are only going to be five listening sessions hosted in the United States. Michigan is hosting one of those five, okay, and that is on the 24th of April. It will be in Lansing, however, there will be two satellite locations, one is in Hart, and then one is also going to be in Marquette. So Walt, if you want to be there, you can make sure that you, that you voice your, your, uh, your concern. So I think it's really incumbent upon all of us to educate ourselves. I see this, I mean, there's some really good news with this, with this particular piece of, uh, of legislation or this rule, but there's also some calls to action. And I think it's, it's really important that we heed those calls to action and really step up and talk about talk to our legislators about these certain things. Um, so first off, the important, the biggest thing is the fact that we have a produce rule. This legislation was passed in January of 2011. Okay, it was passed almost, it was passed two years ago as of the 2013. It, it was in law and the FDA was instructed and, and empowered to create federal rules. Unfortunately, they sat on it for nearly two years, and, and unfortunately, they made my, it was sort of like a Christmas slash New Year's present to get this in my mailbox, this 540-page document, this produce rule, that I had the pleasure, not so much, of reading and, and trying to interpret for folks, because as I found out, um, the devil's in the details. You can talk generally about the produce rule, but as you start to delve into it, that's when we start to get some of the, some of the finer grain of what's really going on. I can tell you that the people that wrote the, the rule were not farmers. I can tell you that the people that wrote the rule were not scientists. Okay? They did, however, consult scientists. I don't know that they consulted farmers. We'll see why we get into it. It is incredibly important for folks to pay attention to this. Think about how these rules are going to impact your lifestyles and, well, your, your livelihoods. Um, who you sell to, it, the, the buyers that you sell to are going to look at this rule irrespective of what is final and what is not final. And they're going to look at um, the rules that are in place for the, the FDA is proposing and whether or not you are subject to that rule this sort of sets a benchmark in the eyes of most buyers. This is going to set a benchmark like, okay, this is safe food. This is what the FDA says is safe food. Irrespective of whether or not you are exempt from this rule or whether or not you have to comply with this rule, this sets the benchmark where most buyers are going to look and say, okay, this is safe food. So if you don't meet these requirements, you're not delivering to me safe food. So that's why these, these rules are important, even if you are exempt. So, want to keep that in mind as well. So the way the rule is, is um, arranged is sort of in a more, it, it gets more and more comprehensive and more and more fine-grained in detail the closer that you get to the end consumer. So you may have, uh, for instance, and I'll use the irrigation rule or the water rules as, a, as an example. Irrigation water, there's actually a threshold under which you don't have to um, you don't have to uh, do anything to your water. So you test your water. If you get a low, um, a low E. coli count, you can just use it as it is. However, as you move closer and closer to the end consumer, that threshold goes down to zero. So if, for instance, you are using water in a pack house situation, that water has to have no E. coli, no generic E. coli. So you see that sort of funneling as you get closer and closer to the end consumer. They ratchet things up a bit. So that's kind of how I arranged that, why that slide is the way it is. For the last two, three, four years, we've been talking about a various number of, of topics. Manure sources and uses, irrigation water, and, and how it pertains to, to sources as well as the quality, employee training, and then farm and equipment sanitation. I can tell you that for the last three or four years, this list has not changed. What we've been talking about in this list, I've continued to, to sort of preach the gospel, if you will, of these topics, okay? Now that we 
we have this rule, guess what the rule covers? All these topics that we've been talking about for the last several years. So you're not going to hear a lot of new stuff in terms of, oh, I've got to go out and, and buy a brand new truck or something in order to be able to do this stuff. A lot of the same practices that we've been talking that growers ought to be thinking about putting in place are in this rule. So you just need to, to remember that all the work that you've been doing up for the last three years, it's not lost. It's part of the bill or part of the, the rule. Um, there are a lot of exempt crops at this point, okay, and my guess is in the end rule there may very well be a few more exempt crops that are not on this list because we were talking, I was talking to a, to a grower and he's like, celery root isn't on this list, and I'm like, celery root? Yeah, celery root, and I was like, okay, that's one, and one of the ones that, that immediately appeared to me are American chestnuts or Chinese chestnuts. They grow up on trees, they drop to the ground. Uh, growers, when they harvest them, they pick them up off the ground, and they're largely cooked. So there is a kill step involved. All of these things are things that are not on this list. They have, uh, FDA has made very clear that this is a, quote, comprehensive list, unquote, which means if it's not on the list, it's not exempt. So at this point, you can see you've got asparagus, beets, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, eggplant, kale, kidney beans, parsley, printer beans, potatoes, root beans, sugar beets, sweet corn turnips, and winter squash. All of these things are either eaten almost <coughs> completely cooked, or they are they have a situation where they're eaten in such little quantities that they consider them to be exempt and low risk. That is what their threshold is. So we need to think about that when we're when we're making comments about maybe potential crops that are not on this comprehensive list to say why don't you include such and so? It's they view it from the standpoint of is it is it all, almost always cooked, and or is it almost always, or is the, the consumption so small that we can afford to have it be an exempt um, crop? Like for instance, in Michigan, many people eat asparagus raw, and we wouldn't think, and in large part, part of the reason we think that way is because Michigan is one of the largest growers of asparagus in the world. So we have a very large uh, crop of asparagus, and we grow a lot of asparagus, and a lot of folks eat it raw. Elsewhere in the nation, not so. And that's, that's in large part why it's exempt. Um, so the way the, implementation, the implementation is supposed to happen is, for those firms that are $500,000 or more, they have two years to implement the rule in all of the, all of the, the segments. For those folks that make $250,000 to $500,000, they are um, asked to have it implemented within three years. For those folks between $25,000 and $250,000, they're asking for it to be implemented within for four years. Now, for those of you that maybe were watching this when it was being debated in 2010 and 2011, you may have heard of the test for a minute. This idea that there's an exemption for those folks $500,000 or less, okay? Well, the FDA was not 100% comfortable with the idea of giving an, a, just an out-and-out -out exemption. So what they said was, everyone must comply with the rule who makes more than $25,000. However, we will give them a qualified exemption for those between $25,000 and $500,000. The FDA reserves the right to revoke that exemption at any time for any reason or for no stated reason. So it's out there that we all need to pay attention to this rule. Now, furthermore, the FDA set a pretty high bar. They said these are $500,000 of all food production. That includes animals that you may have. That includes field crops you may have. That includes grains that you may be keeping to feed to animals. That may also include alfalfa. This is very much a moving target. I have to say that I'm learning every day I sat in on, I did not know that one piece of information until last week, last Monday, or this Monday, when I sat in on a webinar, a national webinar, to find out, indeed, that's how they're calculating this. So, for instance, if you have a nice cash grain farm, and you've got a small roadside stand, my guess is you may only have two years to comply if you've got many, many acres of, of cash grain, because you may be over that $500,000 limit very quickly, especially given our grain years. So it's, it's very easy to hit that upper threshold pretty quick. 
to where you might be, even if your little um, roadside stand only makes $25,000 a year, you may be kicked into that, into that uh, threshold for slip. So it's a, it's a pretty serious thing. And that is something that, that is, I believe that's open for comment. If it's not open for comment, you guys may want to open that up for comment or comment on it. So with regards to the actual doings, the things that you have to do, the one big thing that I, I think this is a call to action for most people, um, manure usage is something that, that you know, everybody sort of brushes with because on the one hand, manure is a, um, it's a nutrient source. A lot of people use it, it's effective. Unfortunately, um, FDA believes that uh, manure is something that, that can be hazardous, and I mean, I agree with them on that, in, in that respect. However, in this case, they're saying that you need to have a nine month pre-harvest window from the time of application of manure to the time that you harvest it. Okay, now the unfortunate thing here is organic standards say it's 120 days, and up till now, our, our standard practice has been if you give 120 days prior to harvest to, to apply manure, you're usually okay. And we've said that, and we've talked about that for years. All of a sudden, now nine months is considered the acceptable practice. Now, the other interesting thing is no matter what you do to that manure, as long as it is an animal byproduct, it needs a 45 day pre harvest interval from the time that it's applied. If you cook it, if you know it is biologically you still need to leave that 45-day pre-harvest interval. So if you've got, for instance, pelletized chicken manure that's been cooked before it's been pelletized, and you know it's safe, and you know it's been cooked, you still want 45 days. The interesting thing, too, is if you use table scraps in a compost, it's considered animal derived, and therefore you must wait that 45 days, even though it's been properly composted. So all of these things are very tricky. Now the other interesting thing is that the FDA, for most of these rules, the FDA says that if you can prove that what you're doing is okay and is safe, then they will allow it. Now, the interesting thing is that they don't qualify what exactly is the burden of proof with regards to demonstrating that it doesn't compromise the safety of the produce. So we have no idea of what kind of burden of proof they're looking for. Do they want to test every load? They want you to have a certificate from a supplier that says that this is safe. How do they want you to, to, to assure that in order to avoid having to deal with this, this qualification? So we don't know yet. And, and there, so there's a lot of unanswered questions. Go ahead, Bill.
So I'm basically harvesting right on the heels of harvest. I've got to get that manure on to ensure a nine month window. If you're harvesting in July, we're talking October, that you've got to apply it. And then that means you have to have whatever crop it is that you were that was on there before out by September in order to get in there to apply it in October. And there, there's logistically this is a real pain. And I don't know how to work around it. <clears throat> That's quite a jump. Well, we've been used to four months right. and jumping up to nine. Uh, that's more than double. Right. <laughs> right. And so I don't know if the science supports this or not. I've heard a lot of scientists, people that know a lot about composting and a lot about, about manure, who said this is completely unrealistic. Now, you know, I don't know. I mean, we've got to get enough scientists stepping up to save it. It seems like in the northern states that the increase in the temperature in the wintertime is part of the survival of a lot of those bacteria with plain beds. Well, you'll, you'll hear a lot of scientists that live and work in California that will say that in some ways those E. coli go in, into dormancy and they insist and they survive. So I'm not entirely, I, I don't know what the real answer is, but I do know that I hear two different answers from two different sets of scientists. And, um, I don't know who they're, which team they're playing for, if you will. So, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Another question on the previous slide with the dollar figures. I'm assuming that's uh, that's gross. The, the total revenue yes. that the farm operation take in and way of income. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And that, so that's the gross of all farm products or all food products. So, if Got, like they say, if you're feeding cash grain to, to, to farm animals, your grain counts, and then you've got the animals that count as well. So it's a, it's a pretty easy to hit that $500,000, especially <coughs> given, given today's prices. I mean, with hay prices being what they are, you're in. Um, with composting, what they, there's actually, uh, they prescribe a particular way of composting. You can either use static composting or trick composting, but the the prescribed way of composting is that it's 131 Fahrenheit for static compost for three days at least. And that means obviously not only that you have to pile it, but that you have to actually test the temperature and record that temperature so that if anyone wants to know what temperature it reached, they have a record of it. So it's, it's a pretty significant thing. Now with turn compost, is, you all know what static compost is, right? You pile it up, you let it rot. That's static compost. Now, for churn compost, that's what a lot of people usually do to churn the compost, get a more even product. In those cases, what they uh, what they say is that it should reach 131 Fahrenheit for 15 days in order to um, to reach the, the right amount of uh, um, of uh, loss of E. coli and salmonella and bacteria. Now, once again, there's that really, really ambiguous. If you can prove <coughs> what you're doing it will not compromise the safety of the product, then you can go ahead and use it. But again, we don't know what the burden of proof is. And I'm still wrestling with that. The, the FDA is, uh, they brought in Dr. Jim Gorney of the Produce Marketing Association, formerly of the Produce Marketing Association. Now he's with, I think he's with the FDA, but I'm not sure. And they've got another FDA official in there. They've been doing these these weekly uh, webinars on these very specific little pieces of the rule. I think they busted it up. I know they busted it up in part so they can handle it. They also busted it up so that you're not connecting, I'm not connecting the dots anyway. I'm having a hard time doing it. So I guess I've got to get a little bit smarter on this to be able to put the two and two together. Go ahead. Um, from what you've been hearing, is this a topic that's getting enough attention that when we have this Q&A and a and Right, I know. At this point, is this one at this point, I've not heard anything on this. And I think what? I've heard nothing on this. What I have heard, because last this past week was on on whether or not you qualify, the, the qualifications of, of what a farm is and, and what how to how they calculate the gross income of a farm was the thing that got the most attention, and that was this idea of total gross sales, including field crops, including animals. That was the thing that got the most attention. I mean, like, I have a feeling there's going to be enough bombshells in this that it's going to keep everybody just kind of whatever whatever period we're talking about, it's going to it's going to make us all kind of like go, 
what? You know, I mean, I really believe that. I mean, I think there's enough, there's enough in this for everybody to get angry about on various and sundry topics. That, that, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be really hard to craft a unified message. And, and that's, and I think, I don't know, I don't think that was intentional, but I think that's the effect. Because it's going to be really difficult to craft that. So anyway, irrigation water. We've been working off of what was considered the body contact standards for swimming water. When they close the lake or stream, that's because the lake or the stream, the stream reached 235 colony forming units or um, of generic E. coli or a rolling average of 126 yeah. So they've now adopted this as an irrigation water standard. That's the law of the land. They've been using this as the leafy greens marketing agreement standard for, for uh, applying uh, irrigation water on leafy greens. Now this is for all crops. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. Um, now they, they, and again, the other thing about this is that what's being measured is generic E. coli per 100 mils of water, okay? So it's pretty, it, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty cut and dry. Now, in wash water, in dunk water, in flume water, in uh, spray water, all of those things, you have to have 100% free of generic E. coli. If your water tests with any E. coli in it, it's considered, it's considered off limits for those reasons. Or it needs to be treated, and we'll get, get to that in a second. Now, the other interesting thing that I think the FDA really didn't want to say that don't do certain irrigation types. So what they did was they created a testing regimen that pretty much spoke to the fact that don't do any, uh, don't use certain irrigation water types. Surface water testing, they encourage folks to test surface water every seven days. Who here is taking a water test of surface water? Okay, so was it? Do you did you find that to be an easy process or a hard process? Yeah. Um. Well, maybe it wasn't too bad. You had a dump. Sure. You know, you sure. want to make sure you get a representative sure. sample. Mm -hmm. So. Was it time intensive, or was it something that you could polish off in about thirty minutes? Well, by the time you get the equipment, you go out there, you take the sample, and then you bring it to a lab. <clears throat> it's pretty time intensive, I guess, but it's. Doable. doable for, would you do it an hour? Did it take you two hours? An hour. Hour, okay. So an hour a week is what they're asking. To give you a sense, this is one of those things where I think they didn't want to say don't use surface waters without some kind of pretreatment, but instead of saying that, they said, oh, we're going to set the testing limit every seven days. So one person, it takes an hour every week to do this, or we could do something else. Use a different irrigation type, or we can treat that water before we irrigate. And I think that's really where they were going with this. They didn't want to say don't use surface water, because there are times when surface waters are all you have, uh, particularly out, in, out west where the California aqueduct runs <coughs> the entire length of California, it's an open ditch. And that's all they have. So they've got to do something. And so doing this way basically says, yep, you've got to treat your water. Um, surface water that's pumped from a well into a pond and stored in that pond, they recommend that that be treated one, or that that be tested once every month. The reason is you've got migratory birds, you've got all sorts of other, other critters that could be getting into that water, that could be changing the microbes that are in that pond. They want to make sure that that is, is considered safe. Finally, groundwater. They, they don't want to necessarily give everybody a pass on groundwater. So they say for that first year, they want you to test it once every three months, starting at planting on through um, until the end of the year. And then after that, test it once a year to make sure that it's still safe. That's kind of what they're going with. Um, I need the well. What's that? I need the well. I need the well, exactly. Okay. Go ahead, Paul. What about I've been testing my well from the start? Do I still have to test the tree? That's this that's an excellent question that I don't know the answer, to be quite honest. Um, and I don't know that they're going to... I'll, I'll ask. I'll ask. We're going to talk about water quality with the FDA folks here in a couple weeks. And I'll ask. Appreciate it. Um, I'm guessing it would come up. It's not only just the time, but uh, you're looking at over a $50 bill. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So that's the other issue. Right. And you're, you've got to drive that within six hours to your testing facility, and that's the that way in order for it to be a valid test. So, yeah, you're right. Good question. Yeah, um, I guess on the, uh, especially the third one, but all, all, actually all of those, uh, from a risk management liability standpoint, uh, um, I don't know if you like, I guess I'm thinking, test and get a swimming pool test kit do that. <coughs> I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is from a reputable lab. Yes. Is what um, so you have the documentation. Here's, this is where I'm really having a difficult time with this rule. There seems to be so many different facets to this rule. What, all that they've introduced is this produce testing rule as part of the whole comprehensive package. My, and and they, they've already said that they're going to be releasing a traceability rule that will be independent of the produce rule. And that there will be another, there's a whole other piece that is going to talk about lab qualifications. And it's like, so every time I think I've got, you know, the couple hundred pages that I need to read done, they keep introducing another five or six hundred pages. So I'm just trying to keep up. And so there's some things I don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure you're going to need to, to go to a reputable lab. Um, the, um, the, the standard is there's an ISO certification for labs. I think it's ISO 1037 or 1032. Uh, that typically a lot of check, don't quote me on the number, it's an ISO standard for labs for doing water testing. And if they have that certification, typically that's acceptable under most auditing schemes for uh, food safety certification. So you may want to put labs like that in order to get And that's going to be way into the weeds, way more into the weeds than we need to go today. But yeah. The state of Michigan should qualify. The state qualifies, absolutely. So if you go to a testing lab in Lansing, that's certainly all right. There's a couple in Grand Rapids that are really good. Um, you can definitely find one. Closest one here, I, I know there's one in Litchfield that's really good. Litchfield Labs that does a generic controller like testing. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's one that does as well. Yeah, so. What was it? Car Labs. Car Labs. Go ahead, sir. Is this kind of cool kind of the labs? Um, good question. I don't know. I don't know. Um, my guess is there's a lot of people that are already had to do this for food safety certification already. There's not going to be a whole lot of new people on the on the books, but I could be wrong. <coughs> because and this, that brings up an interesting point. <coughs> I guess I didn't get my hang on. I missed a slide there. There are exemptions to that rule, and and the exemptions are you know, that um um. <coughs> If there's no direct contact with the plants, then you don't necessarily have to have your water tested. So if you're in an apple orchard and you've got drip under plastic or drip tape running the length of the orchard, it's an exception. You don't necessarily have to have your water tested. Okay? If, for instance, you're using drip under plastic and you're using you're growing tomato plants and, you're and they're vegetated, they aren't started to fruit yet, even if you go over threshold, you don't necessarily have to worry about there being any kind of, of contamination in that. So you may actually be exempt from needing to have that water tested. So be aware that just because you have a water source that needs to be tested every seven days, you may not have to test it if you're growing something like peaches or apples or cherries and you're, and you're watering, say, in a dormant period or a period where there's no, no fruit on the trees. For instance. Right. If you're 100 percent drip under plastic, um, I've actually heard researchers say you could pump raw manure through, you know, irrigation tape and not have a problem. But I wouldn't recommend it because I think the emitters get blocked. Uh, so you said drip under plastic. What about drip uh, on top of the ground? Anytime that you 
increase your risk of any time you, you do something where the water is, is more has a greater potential to come in contact with its roots. There's always a, a greater chance, a greater risk of there being some kind of contamination. So the more you can isolate the water from the plant or the, the, the upper stuff of the plant, the better. Did I see a hand over here? <coughs> Yeah, I think I know the answer, but you just mentioned cherries, but if the cherries, say our tart cherries are harvested in water, obviously they have to have that tested. Sure, any any direct contact of water with fruit needs to be um, needs to be 100% potable, so it needs to be zero E. coli. So, that's the only way for Now, you have to realize that E. coli is, this generic E. coli is simply a, an indicator. It does not, it does not ensure anything about the potability of the water. You could still have salmonella in there, you could still have uh, listeria, as well as heavy metals and other things. So you need to realize that what they're doing is they're using this generic E. coli as a proxy. You could be reasonably assured if you had zero gen generic E. coli in your water that that water is able to be potable or used for the, the um, the things mentioned, whether it's dump tank water or flume water or those things. I would still encourage folks to um, use as, as high quality water as possible as you get closer and closer to the, to the end use. Uh, I have a question. In our food safety manual, should we be stating that we're using drip irrigation? <coughs> yes, absolutely. We should state that and the, way, the way to do that is to have a policy. Okay. If you do a policy sheet, it is the policy of such and so far use only drips, tape under plastic, for <coughs> And that would, that would prove to that one point that we could be exempt. Correct. Um, uh, food safety, though, I don't think you're You're not exempt, that. but what you would do, what you would do is that would be your mitigation step. If, if there's an issue, your mitigation is to use drip under plastic. Since you're using drip under plastic, that would be theoretically. And, and I can't speak to all auditors, but I can some auditors, many auditors, would say that that is enough. That if you do drip under plastic, irrespective of whether or not you go over threshold, that you've got a mitigation set in place. Um, just like if you would use chlorinated water for irrigation, any, if you were to just put that in there and you chlorinate the water all the time, it would be like, okay, that's, that's fine. It's proven to not to be a problem. One of the things that, that FDA is making relatively clear is that everybody really needs to have a food safety manual. And everybody needs to take the time to do what's called a hazard analysis to look at their, at their farm to see what things are a potential problem on their farm and then what they're doing to fix them or what they could do to fix them. So, and, and I think we're going to be running through that later on in my slide. I'll start putting that together. Um, so, but the other issue for those of you, how many folks are doing any kind of agriculture in cities or urban environments? Okay, you guys who are, do you use municipal water? Okay, so in that case, you are then not required to test. Okay, and, um, but you do need to talk to your municipality that furnishes your water and make sure you get a certificate of compliance. So that's the, the, the upside, or the sort of the change, just to give you sense. That was my question. Yep, <laughs> yep. So farm sanitation, okay, there have been, I can't tell you how much talking and angst and consternation has happened with regards to animals in the field, okay. For those of you that have, um, <coughs> that have been following this, this has been a big deal. Um, the Amish especially are like, we can't, we have animals we work with, we can't not have animals in our field. So they, they really, this is sort of one of those things where when you're in the field, you're, you're subject to a certain number of rules, and those rules get fewer and fewer as you get closer and closer to the end user. Um, if you're working in the field, and the animal, the domesticated animal, is a work animal, then it is considered okay to have that animal in the field. Now, it's not okay to have that animal walk over the crops and defecate or, or urinate on the crops. However, it is okay to have that animal in proximity to the field for instance, if you have draft horses and those draft horses are doing plowing, those draft horses can be in an alley next to the field and that is okay. 
However, the draft floor should not be in the field. Like if you're cultivating, the draft floor should not be walking over the crop or to the side of the crop, for instance. If you have a dog that serves as a guard dog slash um, and a wildlife deterrent slash a deer deterrent, if it's a deer dog and if they chase deer out, it's okay to be in close proximity to the field. If, however, it is a companion animal, the companion animal has no place in the field. Interesting little caveats there. Um, I still would like to hear what uh, the, the, mouth, the, the, the uh, mouse or cats and how those figure into the, the final unit. Uh, we're still working on that. But, um, but domestic animals in general are not allowed in the crop itself, but are allowed in proximity to the field if they serve a purpose in terms of raising the crop and maintaining the safety and the health of them. Like a dog that scares away deer, or like workers. Those are all considered okay. However, and this is another thing, there were a lot of environmental groups who really did not want there to be any language about destroying riparian areas to keep wildlife out of the field or putting up fences or doing anything like that. So what they said was, you must use, quote, reasonable precautions in order to minimize the ingress of wildlife. So what they're saying is don't tear out the, 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 the hedgerow, don't um, drain the pond, don't do things that would injure the, the environmental biota, however, take reasonable precautions. So if you have a choice, you know, whether it's using uh, bird stairs versus tearing out all of the places where the birds could move within a 500 mile radius of your, of your operation, those kinds of things, reasonable measures, using the, the bird cannons, for instance, around harvest time, those are considered reasonable precautions versus doing all sorts of oddball things to keep the wildlife out. Now, in the pack house, there is a restriction on both domestic and wild, wild animals. So if you've got a pack house and you've got, if it doubles as a horse stable, for instance, and I've seen this before where you've got your pack line right here, you've got your wash pack line right here, and 100 feet over here is the horse stable, that's not okay? And so the closer you get to the end consumer, the less tolerance there is for a lot of Did you have a question, sir? I saw you kind of put your hand up. No. Okay. Um, so employee training and hygiene. I, I, I left this blank because it's easier to talk about it than to, to write it down. So employees need to know certain things. First off, they need to know the signs and symptoms that they need to say that, that signal to them and to you that they shouldn't be working around produce. If they have this vomiting within the last 24 hours, if they've had diarrhea within the last 24 hours, Hours, if they had fever within the last 24 to 48 hours, those things are, are clear signs. One, they shouldn't be handling produce, and two, that they should not, they should report that to their supervisor. So the supervisor needs to know when they've had diarrhea or they've been vomiting or they've got they've got fever. Because those are clear signs that they could potentially um, convey foodborne illness to the crop as it's being harvested and shipped. Things like norovirus can lay latent on produce long after the produce is fit to eat. Things like salmonella, listeria, clostridium. Lots of things can be put on there from people uh, being sick, not clostridium. Um, but salmonella can, E. coli can, uh, listeria can. All of those things can be really growing to the produce. So, and that's not good. We don't want that. They also need to know how to wash their hands effectively. Hand washing is the single most important thing that anyone can do prior to harvesting and will make a difference. And I say this again and again. You can reduce the influence of foodborne illness by 80% with proper hand washing and 50% uh, of, of colds and, and, and common diseases <coughs> that you get back and forth can be reduced by 50% with proper hand washing. It's really, really, really important. And they need to know how to do it. And they need to know that they have to do it before they start harvesting anything. They need to know that they have to do it after breaks, that they need to do it after smoking, after eating, after going to the bathroom. Those are the single biggest things they can do. If, if you do nothing else, hand washing is the single biggest thing that you can do. It will make a huge difference in the food safety. And they need to know that. 
they need to know how to do that, they need to be taught every year. Go ahead, sir. Now, we'll start and we're going to see on top of that. They would like to hand wash the station in view of insect management. Absolutely. So you can observe it. Right. And they want a policy written, or is it, they want you to show them a policy of your hand washing. Right. And any disciplinary action you would take in right. any way that has failed and all of that. Right. Absolutely. When you're, when you're talking about auditing for a food safety uh, audit scheme like, um, like, like a GAP, if you're doing Primus GAP or, or um, NSF, Ag, GAPs, those, how many folks have heard of GAP? Okay, so most of you have. If you need a food safety audit, for instance, that's what they're going to be auditing you against. FDA, by and large, has not determined how they're going to enforce any of this. So we don't know if they're going to do audits. We don't know if they're going to do spot checks. We don't know if they want to see our manuals and our records once a year. We don't know. Okay, And we won't know, probably for a while. So with record retention, um, <laughs> records must be on site at least six months. Okay, After six months, records need to be stored in a place where they can get, you can get to them within 24 hours. Okay, um, they, need to, they need to be retained for at least two years. And then they can be maintained either digitally or by a hard copy. Now, one of the things that a lot of folks were really worried about is this idea that maybe every load of produce would have to be excuse me, tested for E. coli and other, other diseases. In, in actual fact, now, they specifically stated that FISMA will not require product testing prior to sale. So we know for a fact that. I don't think that's going to be included in the final years at all. <clears throat> now, I learned a lot this last year. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to talk and say, why don't we come back to this? Question? I think it's good at the end of, of the next. So, Bill, there's actually a test for testing a load? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they do that. They're, any load that comes into this country is actually tested if it's for fresh market. So, it's held for seven days and they actually test it for the Kona and Summit. Yeah. Yeah. They're spot tested, not every question they ever do. I know, okay. Um, the gal that, the gal, okay, let me, let me back up that a little bit. So, I've been working with the pickle growers this, this last year. Um, and there is a, an incredibly large uh, impact facility in Wisconsin. And their quality control person has had enormous issues getting pickles from Canada into this country. They'll stop it at the border of for seven days, waiting for the test to come back for the follow up. So I know she's had issues with, with them testing and loads from Canada with regards to the lie and sound of And this is for processing. This is even for fresh. So, yeah, so I know she's had issues. So, and that, that's what I know. Oh, I'll stick, I'll stick with what I know. How's that? Okay. I know she had issues. Whether or not they do that on both borders all the time, I don't know. But I do know she had issues. So, um... I was just those kids had good shelf life. Oh, uh, <laughs> they didn't, and that's why she was so ticked off. She lost a lot of money waiting for that test to come back. So she ended up having to keep them out. Um, so, just to give you some idea, there are a lot of resources out there for you guys to tap. And, and your local conservation district is one of them, and I'm going to give you a complete plug. When we look at the staff in extension throughout the state, there's only three of us in the state. And, and she's only one third time on this on this topic. She's only about ten percent time on this topic. I'm the only hundred percent guy in this topic. So there's not a lot of us in extension working on this. However, there are a bulk <coughs> of folks in um, the conservation district who are here to help and will remain free to all of you to work with. And I'm not sure necessarily that we, in extension, are going to remain free to everyone to access and, and to call. So, so, so Phil, who were the other two I thought you were in? Um, Lisa Triver has a little bit, and then uh, Chris Venema has a little bit. So they're all just little pieces. Um, and then basically, you'll notice there's six dots along here. Tomorrow we're going to be training another, what, 30? 25, 30, I saw a huge list of dog on. So there's going to be another 30 or 25 conservation district technicians who are really up on food safety and are going to be really knowledgeable and able to help you guys
do better jobs at food safety or help you with doing a good job at food safety. And right now there's uh, six of them, Garrett Coggins up in Garrett Traverse, um, Linda Harriman's is in, um, <coughs> she's in Oceana or she in, she's in Mason? I think she's in both. She, okay. And then there's, um, oh, dog, I'm blanking on the rest of them. Rob? Rob. No, I don't think so. Anyway, there's a bunch of folks. We can we can hook you up if necessary, and, and they will remain free forevermore, um, supported by your tax dollars. So um, that those are folks. That you